today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Heavenly, though our lives is in God's hands today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And for that, we just give ourselves away.
And even if they're isolated at home, they still join us in fellowship because you understand the importance of fellowship with the saints. Being here in place that God has called me means so much to me because this is where I've been called to. And I don't feel comfortable at ease outside of the call of God in my life. I'm here because God has called me to be here. The Bible said the foolishness of preaching. Don't it look foolish now to come together according to the world? According to the science that really look foolish now. And they think we ought to just get scared and stay home and lock up in a corner and don't do nothing, don't go nowhere. The foolishness of preaching looks even more foolish now in states where they've shut down everything and commanded that large groups don't gather together. Here we are together, worshiping and praising God. Give God a hand clap. Man, you for you. Man. I'm so glad that God has afforded us this opportunity. On Monday nights, we've been having our Zoom meeting. All I invited, uh, Bible trivia. Man, what, what a great time we've been having in Bible trivia. Uh, just as a side note, I asked the question, what is the longest quarantine that is ever recorded in the Bible? The Bible lists about five different stages in the lives of the people of God that they were quarantined. One popular one we know is leprosy. Uh, seven days, the priest Priests weren't like these preachers today. They had a dubious task. If they declared that you were unclean, they put you apart for seven days. And after seven days, examined you again. And if that spot looked like it was spreading, you were declared a leper and had to quarantine another seven days. And after those 14 days, if you look like you cleared up, he could allow you to pass his way back into the, the kingdom. That's in Leviticus if you uh, read the Old Testament. But there was another one that is longer than that period of time in which one was to practice quarantine that was so long it shocked me. 66 days. If a woman had a female child, she was declared unclean for 14 days and then purification set aside for 66 days. Half the time of a man. That is the longest running quarantine in the Bible. But here we are quarantine. The Bible <laughs> speaks of the very same thing we're practicing. There's nothing outside of the word of God, folks. It's all there. But God is so good. We asked that question and had a great time and many asked their questions and shared we'll be doing the same thing tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. You're welcome to join us in our Zoom meeting and have a little time of fellowship in that capacity. On Tuesday night's prayer meeting is conducted here for those who want to pray and those who want to join us in prayer at your place of prayer, and you're welcome to do that. Join us on Tuesday at prayer time. Wednesday night, we're going through the book of John. John chapter 7, verses 1 through 24. Now, the Bible speaks of how the people were reluctant to speak openly about Jesus for fear of the Jews, for fear of people. Fear will lock you up. Fear will do some damaging things. Jesus was not afraid, even though they, they saw at times he even kill him. But God has not given us a spirit of fear. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Fear of the Jews and why they fear them. And at one time, uh, Jesus healed a young man and uh, they asked his parents. And uh, they didn't want to publicly say anything because anybody who didn't say anything about Jesus was banned from the temple, put out of church otherwise, just for saying something about Jesus. So uh, there was a great, great, great controversy going on. In and through it. In John chapter 7, we look at these concepts. So pray with us, join us, read the Word of God, study the Word of God. Last week we reiterated on how important it is to grow, how important it is to grow spiritually. Jesus said, I am the living bread. You eat this bread, you drink this cup, and your satisfaction will be intact. I'm satisfied. A lot of people are unhappy and unsatisfied. They're, they're not complete because they haven't found how to nourish on the Lord. The children of Israel was on an amazing journey that God nourished them through throughout that journey. And over and over again, they reached these places where they allowed themselves, they did allow themselves to be complacent and not find rest in God's provision. God is faithful. 
He's faithful. I want to pray. I know we're in some, some troubles and times. We're coming to the close of what seemed like one of the most interesting years could ever be. Many of us have went through things. We've had family members. I don't think nobody now has anybody in their family uh, that has not been touched by this virus in some kind of way. We all have someone. We've lost some. We lost our dear brother Ray. Heartbreaking. Sad to see. Life is so tragic. You never know. And even though you might not ever catch the virus, you don't know what the next moment holds. You can leave out of here and somebody hit you in your car and you don't live no more. We gotta live our life like it's on the edge. Cause we never know when the Lord may call us in. And while you're sitting here, we are sitting in the midst of people who have real problems, real situations, some of you got real struggles you need God to help you with. Some of you got real struggles you don't even realize are struggles in your life. Some of us have burdens and problems that we know are there. We need God to help us because in our own strength, we can do nothing. I'm so thankful I can do all things through Christ that strengthen me. Because without his strength, we would be most miserable. But thank God he gives strength to the faith and power to the weary. And as the writer said, they that wait upon the Lord. Is anybody waiting on the Lord? I'm not talking about sitting back doing nothing. I mean, you're waiting on him like a servant that is serving. That's what the tenor of that verse means. You're serving him. You're engaged in him because you need him. You're waiting on him so that he can move on your behalf, that he might do something for you, even give you consolation of the scripture. That's why the Bible said those things that are written are written for our learning, that we do faith and comfort of the scriptures might have, say it with me, hope. Oh. My God, that's great to have today. When you lose your hope, you are in trouble. And maybe you're here today and you've given up on some things. You've given up on ever being free. While they're playing something softly right now, I want you to believe God one more time. I want you to pull it back up right now. You buried it in the deep of your conscience and said, I'll never pray this again. I'll never talk to God about this again because I just don't believe God is going to hear me about that. I want you to resurrect that thought. Resurrect that person. Resurrect that marriage. Resurrect that child. Resurrect it right now because God can still move. And as we bring it before the Lord and cry out to God and ask God to move, we're praying to the all-sovereign one. And we believe not only are you holy, we believe that you are all-powerful. And we believe the battle is not over. We can shout even right now, even though we don't see the manifestation of it. But we call on you, O oh God, and ask that you would heal, help your people, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we're standing in the need of prayer, Lord. We need power in this generation, Lord. We need strength, Lord. Thank you for what you did in days of old, Lord. But oh God, oh God, we stand here today, Lord. Our hearts are heavy, Lord. Thank you. 
Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated in the glorious presence of God. The history that brings us to this passage is quite intense for God was the mastermind behind the lives of the people and obedience to his word. Obedience to his word is the ultimate challenge that was needed in order to live life God wanted for them. Esau had some sons. His descendants waged war against the people of God. And if they waged war against the people of God, something very interesting happened. Sin crept in and the people came under attack. During their exodus, the exodus marks the account of God's people coming out of Egypt. That was exodus meaning coming out. When they crossed the Red Sea and came out of Egypt on their journey, they fell under attack. They fell under attack and something very, very, very cowardly was done. The people that attacked them they attacked them at their weakest point. And when they attacked them, they had no mercy on people that was handicapped, small, couldn't move as fast. They attacked them from the rear. They would travel in a caravan. And as they traveled in this amazing caravan, God's covering was over them. But they came under this attack. When they came under attack, Moses, who is now up in age. He orders Joshua to fight. Get some young men. Y'all go fight the enemy off. I'm going to go up on the mountain. I'm going to pray for you. We live in a generation where a major disconnect has happened. Our young do not want to connect with the old. And the Bible says the old man know the way. The young man have the strength that the old man don't have. Moses is now interceding for them. And while he's interceding for them, as long as his hands I lift it up. There's a glorious victory they're going to encounter. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 11, as Moses held up his hand, Israel prevails. His hands got heavy, and I don't know about you, but in this journey sometimes, this thing gets heavy. And he wake up and fell down on him. His hands begin to come down. I don't know why people always expect leaders to be on the up, but every now and then we need somebody that would help hold. Look at somebody and ask him, will you help hold me up? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you help hold me up? People are easy to talk, but I need somebody that would help hold me up. The Bible says they begin to hold his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, Aaron and her. And as they held his hands up, they kept fighting and winning. And the critical thing in order to get victory was that they had to be total surrender to the Lord. And the hands lifted up. I always told you it was a symbolic gesture that I'm surrendering to the Lord. Because it's in the best hands when it's in. I like that. The Lord gave me that. It's in the best hands when it's in his hands. So they got the victory that God promised them. And they got it. And God told them, I'm going to deal with this later on. I know they think they might have did something here, but I'm going to deal with it later on. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, the Lord said, look, I'm going to remember what they did, and I want you to remember what they did. I don't want you to do nothing about it, but I want you to remember what they did. And I'm coming to tell somebody here, whoever it is messing with you, whoever it is that is talking about you, whoever it is that is willing to attack you, is not attacking so much you, but the God in you, because you are God's anointing. You gotta be careful how you handle God's anointing. You gotta be careful how you put your mouth on God's anointing. You gotta be careful how you attack God's anointing. It's a cowardly thing for people to say stuff behind your back and set you up for failure and all this. It's a cowardly thing to attack the tribe and not go up against them head to toe. You go from the back and come to and fight those who are weak and various. Lord say, I'm gonna remember what they did, how they did you, by the way. And I just want somebody to know today been hurt by someone, you've been hurt by what they did, but God remembers exactly what happened and the Lord said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He told us one time, you stand back. I'm going to fight in my own time and in my own way. God said, I'm going to remember this and there's coming a time I'm going to deal with your enemies. Some of y'all got enemies, but it won't go away. But I'm going to tell you something right now. God's going to deal with your enemies. Victory shall be mine if I hold my peace and let the Lord. Somebody clap your hands. Let the 
agree. He cared more for the people. He was more worried about the people than God. You're in a dangerous place when you're the people's choice, trying to please people. If this church would have kept everybody that come through here, oh, we'd be packed out, y'all. we need another place. I'm not saying we ran people off, but the truth ran some off. The truth caused some to walk away. Jesus did not a crowd of 5,000 plus because he laid truth down. He stopped dropping the truth down and told them what they must do in order to have the eternal life. And they said, this is hard. It ain't hard. It's hard when you don't want to do it. The way of holiness is hard for a sinner that don't want to live right. They find some other excuse to go when really deep down within, they didn't want to get right with God. But it's time to get right with God. And the old folks say, do it now. Somebody hard, do it now. Yeah. He cared more for the people. He's the people's choice, remember? And when you're the people's choice, there's things that's going to bother you. He was really in a war. He was in a war he didn't understand. In this Christian life, you are fighting sometimes what you don't understand. You're in a war with sin in your own life. This was the sin in his own life he had to deal with, y'all. Then he had to deal with the sin of his enemy. And then thirdly, the people that he was associated with. And these are dangerous areas. The way of a man are right in his own eyes, the Bible said. So you can't trust your own heart. The Bible said don't trust your heart. It's filthy. It's wicked. Who can know it? Only God can know it. You can't trust yourself. you got to trust God in his word because your ways are not his ways. There is a way that seems right. A lot of us do what seems right, but it ain't right. you got to go by what God said. When you know the word of God, said don't do it and you're still trying to do it. You are at war with yourself and then you come to grips to say this is what God has said and I'm going to fight this thing. I'm going to fight this thing. God said don't do it and don't go there. I'm not going to give in. It's a fight to the end and if you're not fighting the devil is going to win. If you don't fight the urge and to resist the sin that easily possess you, you're going to lose the battle. But oh God will give you strength today. How many of these I believe God has given us power, Holy Ghost power, to win a war. We couldn't win on our own. I believe God has given us power to fight a battle. We could not fight on our own. The Bible said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, that word beseech me and I beg of you, as strangers and pilgrims. Why? If you get familiar and act like you're friendly to the world, the world is going to inundate all of its tactics on you. They're going to inundate all of its ways on you. So Peter said, here's my advice to you. I beg of you, as strangers and pilgrims passing through. I'm just on a journey, y'all. This world is not my home. Where I live, I love it, man. We got a nice oasis I enjoy, but I know this is only temporary. This home is not my home. I got a new home over in glory. I kind of feel like preaching, y'all. I got somewhere to go. After all this is over, I don't care how I die, I got somewhere to go. I'm on my way somewhere. Somebody look at somebody and tell them, I'm on my way. Because we know if they don't get free, 
If God don't break those yokes that bind you, they'll never get free. And they'll die in their sin. They'll die craving for alcohol. And as best we know the Bible, the person that died with an addiction, they end up in hell, yearning for that addiction, and never can fulfill it. The man that's an alcoholic dies and go to hell. And he goes to hell craving a drink, and he never get it. He go to hell craving a crack, and can never get it. He go to hell craving somebody to do something for them that they should have did for themselves, and can never get it. They go to hell craving a cigarette that died from emphysema and all of that poison in their lungs, and die and go to hell, and can never get another cigarette, can never get another drink. But they body crazy. But oh. I want you to know there's power. Somebody have a power, power. to win the war. You got to do the critical. You got to make the ultimate decision. Job said in just one, and in Job uh, thirty-one and one, he said, "Look, y'all, I made a covenant with my eyes. I did this now. Holy Ghost didn't do this. I made a covenant with my eyes. I agreed I'm not going to look at a woman." And think the way I'm not supposed to think about my sister. I made this agreement with my eyes. I'm not going to look. In this day and age, it's hard not to see what you see. But you don't have to think wrong about what you see. It's hard not to see someone now. Folks don't want to put clothes on. They don't want to conduct themselves orderly. Men looking like I don't know what. Women looking like I don't know what. And you see it, but you know it's there. That don't mean you got to think on it. That don't mean you got to act on it. I went in construction and sometimes we would be working in public places. And some of those guys were so out of control that when a woman walked by, they would scream something derogatory. They would say something about parts of a body. And some of them, bless God, they were dressed so poorly. They looked like a tramp. They looked like a whore. They looked like they wanted to tell. I know I can't get no help here today. But the Bible speaks. There is the entire of a harlot. And you can dump yourself like the kind of attention you're trying to attract. If you don't want garbage, then don't look like it. If you don't want nobody looking at you and saying something, don't go around looking all kind of sleazy and easy and weedy. Get some clothes off. Holiness becomes our house forever. Hallelujah. I'm not saying you got to go right here looking like a Quaker. Like you some Amish with a 50 foot dress on and some shoes look like you came out of the wood. But I'm saying adore yourself with holy clothes. Some people can't control what they see. Amen. I know some people right now, I don't care what kind of boat they see, they go crazy. When they see a boat, their eyes get big. Bigger the prettier the better. When they see fish in the water, it's like a drug deal. You ain't got to be the one catching it. Somebody else can catch it. They sight stuff. Because they see it. And there's a love in them for that. I'm trying to help you understand something that we can think about. Because when we see certain things that we see, we got to know that it's God and know that God is with us. But there's some things you see you need to see and you need to cancel right away. Hear me, young man. Some of you look fast. Oh, well, I'm preaching. I only say the whole lot. That's all. Some of you folks so fast. Girls and boys now. And some of these older women won't dress like they older women. Yeah. And I came in here to the church. Then Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. And Psalms 101, verse 21, David said, I'm going to behave myself. Yeah. David said, I'm going to behave myself. Yeah. You know what he said? My daddy going to make me behave. You see that? Yeah. You see, we were raised. My daddy made us behave under his rule. But now you're under authority of God. You have to make a choice to behave yourself. God ain't going to make you do it. You got to choose to do it. It's very quiet. That's okay. You got to choose to do it. God ain't going to make you turn that stuff off. You got to grieve. You got to know it grieves God enough to turn it on. You got to know that God heart breaks when you do it and turn it on. You got to feel sin and feel the weight of sin. You got to feel that it is derogatory against the holy God. Until you feel that way, you will embrace it and enjoy it and impart upon it. David said, I'm going to behave myself.
myself. Because why don't I find my behavior? Now that we've made this decision, we give you the steps and we'll go. You must get in the word. Psalms 119 and 11. The word I hid in my heart. Now look at me as I say this. I love you dearly. But if you're not spending quality time in the word, you'll never win the victory over sin. The word wasn't in Saul's heart. It might have was in his head, but it wasn't in his heart. And because the word was so full in his head, he didn't mind disobeying what God said. When it's in your heart, it's different. There's a respect toward it. There's a reverence toward it. There's an obedience toward it when it gets in your heart. This is why my message is to the heart. Our church is called Heart to Heart Ministries. I cry a lot, and I think sometimes because I cry a lot, people pass me by because it's from the heart. And if they never touch your heart, all they did was just get in your head. David said, I hid it in my heart that I might not sin. The writer of Hebrews, some say it's Paul, we don't know. But the word has power in Hebrews chapter 4. In verse 12, the Bible says it's quick, powerful. Now those are good words right there. And sharp. Eight two-edged sword. Now, in the day that this was written, a two-edged sword was the weapon of choice. You know why? Whatever they miss coming down, they can catch it coming back up. A two-edged sword. So the writer says the word is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, here's the important part that connects us spiritually. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Let me say something here. There can be no escape from the penetrating, searching application of the Word of God. If you are not going to get in the Word, you're not going to master sin. You're not going to get the mastery over your own life that is pulling you out of the will of God. The Word of God redefines your thinking so that you might think like God. And then there's this piercing power of the Word that separates from your soul the cravings of worldliness, all of it. There is this continual apply of the word that separates from your soul. So what the word does, it gets in there. And where pornography and all of those other addictions have tied themselves soulishly to you, it puts a wedge in there. See, some of us said, I'm going to stop and couldn't stop. But when God got in there, he gave you power to stop. Yeah. I quit smoking crack so many times, y'all. I know what I'm talking about. There was a soul tied to that crack. That stuff tasted so good to me. I would spend all my money and then get shamed. I spent all my money. I was so much tied to it. I never told you some of you. Maybe you never heard it. I'll tell you. I was so hooked on it so bad, I was dysfunctional. I would give my mother my money so that I would not spend it on crack. And I knew if I had money in my hand, the crack deal was going to get it. One day I gave my mother enough money. I said I was going to keep this part aside, and this is what I'm going to smoke up. Somebody know what I'm talking about here. And I gave her the rest of my money. I was so addicted to this stuff that by the time I ran out of the money I had reserved, I started sitting on the other side of the room thinking about my money my mother had in her room while she was asleep. And I'm thinking, I want more crack. I had already spent the money I had aside for it, but I was so hooked on sin, so hooked on my truck that I said I'll do whatever I can to get more crap. My mother lived in a house. She had drug addict sons and I was one of them, the ring leader of them in the house. I go in her room while she got my money and I'm going to get my money to get more crap because I'm not separated from this stuff. The love for is pulling me in a direction I don't even want to go, but I had no control. Somebody need to hear my testimony today. I go in that room. My mother is laying there sleeping. My mother lived by herself for a long time. So she had a gun in 
under her pillow. She felt more comfortable with a light on and a gun. That's the way she slept. So I knew I had to be cool and calm if I'm going to get in here to get my money. Her bed was up against the wall. Her pocketbook was on the other side of her. And I go in there, crack down, drag down on crack. I get a broom. I'm going to pull her pocketbook up. And I'm going to get my money and go get more dough. But I go in there and I get the broom. And I lift it up for the pocketbook to slide down. Because that's how sinful I was. I hit the wall, the ceiling. And the ceiling woke her up. And she came from under the pillow with the gun. Almost shot the drug addict, son. She looked at me and screamed, Michael. It was then I realized. It was then, Sister Dale, I realized God's got to help me. I sat that thing down and went around and sat down that night. It was about 2, 3 in the morning. I could not go to sleep. I was so messed up. The weight of my sin hit on me so bad. When I finally went to sleep, I woke up. My mother was around there cooking breakfast. I've told this story many times. My mother was around there cooking breakfast, humming. She always loved to sing just close to walk with me. She ran in there singing. I knew I had to face her. I was busted. I went in there, Keith, and I looked at her and I said, Mama, I'm sorry, but I got a problem. You know, sometimes until you admit you got a problem, you will get no help. But it looked like something just released in me when I was willing to admit I got a problem. And my mother told me what I knew she knew already. She said, I know, baby. But she said something I wasn't looking to hear. I'm praying for you. But this is what I'm talking about. I'm going to pray for you. Woo, God. I'm going to pray for you. Some of you don't know the nights I sit up and walk and think about you and pray for you. My mother was praying for me and I didn't know it. That Sunday night, I had a gig. Because I played at church in the morning. The bar at night. I went to the church, played, got my little offering they would give me for playing, because that's all I wanted was the offering. I went to the train winds, I played there. We go out in the alley and drink and smoke. But I'll never forget when I was standing there, God came to me in the bar. I was high, I was on my drugs, but I heard God. Don't you tell me God won't come where you at? God will come in a bar. He'll come in skin low. He'll come wherever you are, and he'll meet you there. The Lord came in and said, I'm getting you. I'm coming to get you out of here. Nobody knew the joy I felt. I didn't really know what that means. But at the same time, a preacher had called my house, gave my mother his number. He wanted me to play the organ under the tent. And from that moment on, God began to rehabilitate me. But I had to cut associations off. I quit the band. They didn't like that. They offered me more money. I told them it wasn't about money. I was trying to get free. When you want to get free enough, you'll do some drastic things. I didn't have the Holy Ghost yet. But I told them I was quitting. Because I knew I was on my way toward it. And I knew I needed God. And I quit the band. My mother was so shocked. I started working with this preacher. And God started pulling me in. Thursday night over there on 7th Street, God called me in prayer. I was down there praying because everybody else was praying. But God saw something in me. He knew I would be here. 30 something years later, standing up, declaring to somebody the goodness of the Lord. God saved me. God rehabilitated me. He took the drug taste. I didn't go to rehab. I went on my knees in prayer. And God took it all away. The same drug dealer that stood on the corner when he saw me coming, he would go to reach him for it because he knew what I was coming for. He was shocked when I kept going. The Holy Ghost gave me power to keep going. The Holy Ghost gave me power. I was shocked I kept going because usually I stopped. Even if I didn't have money because I was good enough, they would give me some old credit. I kept going. Then I noticed the next time I kept going. Then I noticed I didn't want it no more. I put cigarettes down. I used to pack a smoke up. A pack of Newports a day. That was the cigarette, Newport shorts. I used to just pack and a half a day, a pack a day at definite. God took it away. I just stopped. 
no turkey. God took it away. I was getting in the Word. I was going to Sunday school. And the Word was separating all of that stuff from me. And not only was it piercing and separating my, my craving for it, He did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And took it all away. The Lord said, men ought to always pray in Luke 18, 1. You got to pray. If you don't pray, you're not going to last. You got to pray. You got to pray. In Luke 18 and 1, he said, men ought to always pray and not faint. I want to ask you, saints, do you have a prayer life? Do you think Saul would have did what he did if he had a prayer life? No. If he'd have been in the Word, you think he'd have did that? No. David realized this and he prayed. He prayed in Psalms 19 and verse 31, 13. He said, Lord, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let him not have dominion over me. I don't want to make that great transgression to sin against you. Would you pray that? So here you have focus on Christ, time in his word, prayer. Not feeding your desire to do such things. Because Agag is coming back. You're going to come back with force. You know what the friends did? They came back. And they offered to roll up a joint. Usually that was, that was a welcome sign. Come on, you want to burn one? They weren't looking to hear me say, no, I don't want to. And then I left. And you know what I realized then? I don't need to come back around these folks. I thought I could still have these friends. No. I had to get some new friends. My inheritance now was among them that was sanctified. If I stayed around them, I'd have slipped back into that. So I had no sense to know. Association brings assimilation. I got away from them. Saul never got away from himself. He never got away from his sin. He never got away from those things that caused him to want to come in and be a, a, a mark to the people. So the preacher has to come in his life and rebuke him and straighten him out. And some of you don't like the pastor getting in your face and up front personal with you. But God, what happened that if you're going to be saved, he's going to send a word. It might be challenging and encouraging, but if you love God and let his word get in there, it'll do a work. He said, look, pray again. Saul says in 1 Samuel 30, 11, 32. He said, bring him, bring him. And God comes and he thinks, surely they're not going to kill me. Samuel said to him in verse 33, Your sword made women childless. Your mother is going to go childless too. And he hacked him to pieces. You have a duty. As I close. You have a duty. It is your duty to deal with the sin in your life. And separate from your heart. Jeremiah 4.14, O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. Come on and stand. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? The question is asked because he knows. If you let this stuff stay, it's going to grow. It's going to fester. It's going to develop. It's time to deal with it. It's time to deal with it. Altar is open. If you want to come up and pray, you're welcome to come and pray. If you want to kneel, you're welcome. You can come here. We're going to pray for you and with you. How would you deal with the sin in your life? How would you deal with Agag? If it's still alive, it needs to be put to death. As they play softly, I want you to come. Let's pray. Let's pray for you and with you. Let's pray about it. Believe God for it. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you that the truth of your word prevails strong in our hearts. Father, we can't get away from it. You're calling the people unto holiness. You're calling the people unto truth. Truth that transforms. And I pray, Father, that you will meet everyone at their place of need. Touch that one now that is wrestling. And so long to be free, grant deliverance in their life. Grant peace that passes all understanding. Do it, Father, in the name of Jesus. Do it by your power. Do it by your grace. I 
pray for that one that will watch this lady. Father, maybe they're dealing with something they don't want to talk about. Maybe they're dealing with something so vile and so vast, and yet wonder can they ever be free. Father, I thank you. You've given me a testimony. So many times I long to be free of that plague, that, that disease. My sin was just so grievous. But I thank you, Lord, that you, in your grace, you did a marvelous work. You took that habit away. There's others in this room that will say, God, you are great. You took it away from us, and we thank you. I thank you that you're working on us for that situation that's even right now. And as we lift it up to you, Father, thank you for it. Thank you for delivering. Thank you for victory. We're going to get in the Word. We're going to pray. We're going to fight this thing together. I'm going to encourage my brother and my sister to fight. I'm going to encourage you to pray like never before. I'm going to encourage you to read the Word of God. Let it get in your heart. Meditate on it. Think on it. Apply it in everyday life. Father, when all is said and done, we will give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Lord. You know. Oh, bless his name. Hallelujah. God bless you.